Hello, everyone. We're so glad that you have made time to join us tonight. My name is Winnie, and I am on staff with Crew Singapore. It is my great pleasure to be our host today. A very warm welcome to Unveil X, Experiencing God by Exploring His Word. Crew Singapore has been organizing this webinar series for youth and young adults to dive deeper into God's Word and be discipled by seasoned pastors and leaders. In this process, we pray that you will draw closer to God in your life. Over four Thursdays in August and September, Unveil X explores the teachings of Jesus in what is commonly known as the Beatitudes. By manifesting these upside down core values that are close to Jesus' heart, the people of God are set apart from the people in the world. The Beatitudes describe the character of a spirit-filled community and provide the foundation for a life of true mm. happiness. We are very privileged to have Pastor Benny Ho to continue this series with us. Pastor Benny has been a pastor and Bible teacher for more than 20 years. He has served as a pastor and church consultant with several churches in Asia and Australia. Pastor Benny's twin passions in ministry are expository preaching and mentoring. He has founded Arrow's School of Ministry to help local churches establish equipping tracks to enable every member to be a minister. He is now the senior pastor of Faith Community Church in Perth, Western Australia. Two weeks ago, Pastor Benny has shared with us from Matthew chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 on blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth as well as blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. What left me a deep impression was that meekness is not weakness. It doesn't mean fragile, frail, or timidity. In fact, meekness is power and strength under control. So for this Beatitude series, session 5, he will be covering blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy with the reference text from Matthew 5, verse 7. And Pastor Benny will be covering two sessions today. In between, there will be the short Q&A. And after that, uh, we will continue with the next session. So if you have any question, remember to click the Q&A box, key in your question, and then you upvote the question. You put an upvote to question. So the question, please. Uh, bear in mind that we will not be able to answer all the questions, so we will only select those with the top votes. Before we begin, allow me to pray for Pastor Benny and also ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening that we can gather. I pray, Father, we surrender our hearts, we surrender our lives to you. We ask, Father, would you speak to our hearts, transform our minds with the word of God. Help us to understand the values of our Lord Jesus. Help us to live out these values in our lives. Help us to be bold mm. and courageous witnesses for Christ. So Lord, we listen with open ears and open hearts as uh, Pastor Benny delivers mm. uh, the word to us. I pray that you empower him and that you grant us a very fruitful time of learning. We commit this evening to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Over to you. Amen. Thank you, Winnie. Welcome, everyone. Uh, and greetings from Perth, uh, Western Australia. And as usual, we're going to begin by reading Matthew chapter 5. I'll just read through with you the entire Beatitude so that we can get the context and then I'll zoom in on the ones that we need to do today. Okay, we, we, we go back to Matthew chapter 5. I start reading from verse 1 onwards. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who moan, for they can be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
Lord, we ask that you open our eyes to behold wonderful things in your scripture tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount actually began with the ingredients of Christian character before he looked at the, the influence of that character upon society. And over the last uh, two sessions that we had together, the Beatitudes we have learned began with the right attitude towards God, being poor in spirit. And then once we are poor in spirit, it will lead to a right attitude towards sin. And as a result, we have a spirit that knows how to moan uh, when we, well, that, that, that leads to repentance. Okay, and this in turn will lead to right attitudes towards our dealings with other people. And that is the spirit of meekness. And then we begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness, which makes us more and more like Jesus. And that will lead us now to a heart of mercy. And this is the fifth beatitude that we will be studying uh, this evening. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let me introduce this, uh, my subject this way. Once I was getting my photograph taken uh, for Bible College, and I think it was Tongling Bible College, and I jokingly said to the photographer who was there to take our publicity photo, I, I just jokingly said to him, I hope your photo will do me justice. And this photographer turned to me and then he jokingly said this. He said, Pastor, you don't need justice, you need mercy. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah. but you know, today we do live in a society that is built upon merits rather than mercy. So to be merciful is not part of the, ton, the top 10 attributes of successful people. Uh, I don't think you will see showing mercy as something that we need to do uh, in the marketplace, but rather it is something that we may say we need to do in church. And that is why one of our preoccupations today in modern living is to fight for our rights. You know, everyone wants to guard our own turf. We look after number one, which is yours truly. You know, we fight for what we think we deserve. We clench fees. You know, people are fighting for their rights all the time. I know I have a right to the best service since I paid service charge. You know, I have the right to the best schools since I'm a Methodist. You know, I have a right to the best parking lot because I'm the CEO. It's just rights, rights, rights. And the Roman world that our Lord Jesus was speaking into at that time also does not admire mercy. In fact, some of the philosophers call mercy a disease of the soul. They don't like mercy because mercy is also seen as something that is weak. But our Lord Jesus changed all of that. That's why we said it is a counterculture values. He changed all of that. Our Lord Jesus lived out mercy wherever he goes and he taught his disciples to practice mercy. Now to the Lord, mercy is a mark of strength rather than weakness. Now some time ago, I actually had an interesting uh, experience. There was quite a number of years ago, I had an interesting experience when I attended the passing out parade uh, of the, as, as the Associate National Chaplain for the Girls Brigade in Singapore. You know, at that time, I was an Associate National Chaplain for the Girls Brigade. And for that passing out parade, we actually invited, at that time, the Minister of Education uh, for Singapore, and, and at that time, it was Rear Admiral Teo Chi Hien to actually grace the occasion. And at one point in the ceremony, there was supposed to be a special salute for the minister. And what was meant to happen was that there is a girl uh, in, in the brigade that was specially selected to blow the bugle, you know, as for the salute. But when that moment came, I, I cannot forget that moment, the unthinkable thing happened because she tried to blow, but no sound came out. And they waited for a while, but just, she just couldn't get the sound out for some reason. And in the end, the band just went on and the salute was passed. The vice president of the Girls' Brigade is a good friend of mine, and she turned to the minister as they were sitting down, and he said to the minister, I'm so sorry, Mr. Minister. I am sure that this poor girl must be feeling terrible uh, because she practiced so hard for this moment. And Admiral Teo at that time turned to the president and said, can you bring her to me because I would like to encourage her? And they did. And he met her and he encouraged her. 
And she said to him, Minister, if you give me another chance, I will blow it right for you. And you know what happened was during the refreshment, suddenly the bugle sounded and uh, he was, she was blowing it right and everybody gave her a, a, a clap. And the most amazing thing was that the minister at that time was talking to some other people and he actually excused himself and he actually walked up to that girl, shook her hands and actually said to her, thank you. And she was so empowered by the entire event. Now, what happened to me was this. The minister demonstrated mercy at a time of her need and totally empowered her to do what is right. Mercy to me is truly a mark of strength and not weakness. It is an awesome thought, you know, to think that when we are practicing mercy, we are actually practicing one of the attributes of God. Mercy makes me a representative of God in somebody else's life. Mercy is when we have a deep concern for people who are in need. It has to do always with the less fortunate, uh, those who are less fortunate than us because of disappointment, because of disease or because of distress. And somebody once said this, mercy is God's ministry to the miserable. I like that. Mercy is God's ministry to the miserable. You know, the Greek word mercy is the word eliamon, eliamon, E-L-E-E-M-O-N, eliamon. And it literally means actively compassionate. Now, listen carefully. Mercy is literally active compassion. It's actively compassionate. The Hebrew word for mercy is chesed, C-H-E-C-E-D, which literally means to get inside someone's skin and to see from their point of view. Okay? And, and this is so powerful, to get into somebody's skin and actually see from their point of view. And then we can feel what they're feeling, and we move in, and then we act and, and uh, we on behalf of the one who is hurting. I like that. Mercy is getting into the skin of someone else, see things from their perspective, and then we move in. And begin to feel what they are feeling. We move in and we act on behalf of the one who is hurting. And I think this is exactly what Jesus did when he chose to leave the comfort of heaven and to become one of us. So can I put it this way? Sympathy is when I feel sad that you have lost your job. Okay, that's sympathy. Empathy is when I understand how terrible you feel because I have been jobless before. But mercy is when I offer to pay your bills. You got that? Sympathy is just, you know, I, I feel sad that you lost your job. Empathy is when I understand how terrible you feel because you have been jobless before. But mercy is when I offer to pay your bills. And that's what Jesus was talking about in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember, in the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, this traveler was robbed, bitten, left to die on the road to Jericho. Three persons in the parable passed by. The first was a priest. He didn't even stop. The Bible tells us he just passed by the other side. Perhaps he was too busy, you know, practicing his scripture memory or meditating on the Beatitudes. But perhaps he was on his way to perform some temple duties, whatever it may be. Um, or maybe he was afraid of touching a, a, a dead person. Then that would make him unclean. And that's why he passed by on the other side. The second guy was a Levite. He was a bit more curious. So he did stop. He looked. And then he realized it's not his cell member. So he moved on. He didn't want to be late for Sunday service. So he just got to run. And then finally came the Samaritan. He stopped. He saw. And he put himself in that poor man's shoes. He took the time. He decided to do something about it. He applied first aid then put him on his donkey, sent him to an inn, paid the bill, and on top of that, left his mobile number so that, the, the, so that they can call him if there are further bills to pay. What is that? That is mercy in action. Mercy in action. Mercy is when we hold back what people deserve and instead we give them what they do not deserve. That's mercy. We hold back what they deserve which could be something very negative, but instead we give them what they do not deserve. Justice always gives us what we deserve, 
but mercy take us further and give us what we do not deserve. That's why mercy is so powerful. Justice just give us what we deserve, but mercy take us further, give us what we don't deserve. Blessed are the merciful. You know, and that is why we are free. And because just because mercy is when we, we go beyond, okay, and we give people what they don't deserve, that's why we are free to decide who we want to show mercy to. Now, don't miss this. That's a very important idea. That because mercy is something people don't deserve, that's why we can choose who we want to show mercy to. And that's why God can say, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. See, God is obligated to give everyone justice, but He is free to give mercy to whoever He chooses. Now, my question is this. Who does God choose to give His mercy to? Uh, if we understand that, then we can put ourselves in a position where God can actually choose to give mercy to us, right? So, who does God choose to give His mercy to? I want to outline two groups for you. Number one, God gives mercy to those who ask for mercy. That's number one. Those who ask for mercy. Now, sometimes I meet Christians and I like to ask them, so what's new? And a lot of times they will quote the words of uh, Ecclesiastes, right? There is nothing new under the sun. But I always tell them, but there is. The Bible actually says His mercies are new every morning. God's mercies are new every morning and they are available for all those who ask for it. But the problem is this, you know, that most of us, very few people actually feel a need to ask for God's mercy. We think we deserve justice instead. That's why people always say, it's not fair, it's not fair. Whatever happens, you say, it's not fair. Remember the Pharisee who came to the temple and then he read his uh, spiritual resume to God and he thought it was prayer, he went home empty. But the tax collector actually beat his chest and cried out for mercy. And what did he get? He got mercy. Remember the two thieves on the cross? One of them asked for mercy. And what happened? He got a ticket to heaven. The other one didn't. And I think he was on his way to hell, you see. So that's number one. Always remember this. Who would God give mercy or show mercy to? It's those who ask for mercy. Here's number two. It's those who would pass it on. That's very important. Those who would pass it on. I think mercy acts like electricity. We need to pass it on in order to receive more. See, Jesus was not asking us to be merciful occasionally, but to be a constant channel of God's mercy. See, and to receive it and then to pass it on. To receive mercy and to give mercy. But the moment we hold unforgiveness, resentment or bitterness, mercy stops flowing. See, and mercy must flow out of your heart before new mercies can flow into your heart. You must act mercifully towards others and then can you receive mercy. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Can you see the flow? Blessed are those who are merciful, which means you are merciful, you give mercy, and they shall obtain mercy. See, mercy must flow out of our heart, and then mercies can flow in. Okay, Luke chapter 6, verse 36, talking about our attitude towards our enemy, actually say this, be merciful just as our Father is merciful. Jesus himself taught his disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sin. Now, when you look at this verse, it's very easy sometimes to and to end up thinking that God is about take for tech. You know, that if you don't forgive others, then God just don't want to forgive you. You know, it's like take for tech. But is that really what it means? I, I, I don't think so. Uh, Shakespeare once wrote this. 
the mercy of God is not strained. It falls like rain from heaven. Now, let me use that idea and, and show you something here. Now, imagine that there is a flower, okay? And this flower is growing beautifully. And as it grows, why, why is it able to grow? It's because rain keeps coming, right? God sends rain from heaven and therefore this flower can grow. Okay, and the mercies of God is like the rain that God sends. It is always there. It's always coming. And that's why we all can survive. We, we all can exist. But the thing is this, the moment we hold unforgiveness in our heart, it's not that the rain stops coming, but rather it's your unforgiveness becomes like a plastic sheet that you draw over yourself. Okay, and, and it becomes a barrier. The, your unforgiveness is like that plastic sheet that you draw over yourself because you refuse to forgive others. So what happened? The rain still comes. The mercy of God is still flowing, but you cannot receive it anymore. Okay? And it's not because God stopped being merciful, but it's because you have caused a plastic sheet of unforgiveness to come over you. And as a result, you cannot receive the mercy of God. But it's only when we choose to forgive that's when we remove that plastic sheet and then we can again receive God's forgiveness, God's mercy once again. See, when you live in unforgiveness, our emotions are chained, our thoughts are bound, our spiritual growth gets stunted. But when we show mercy, that's when we are liberated. See, and we are set free from grudges and our hearts uh, is removed, you know, from every blockage. See, and when we, we need to show mercy. We need to forgive. And then as a result, our hearts will be, all the blockages can be removed and mercy can come again. Mercy cannot flow unless you pass it on to others. Okay, mercy cannot flow unless you pass it on to others. Um, here are two enemies I want to leave with you to merciful living. Now, if you really want to live a merciful life, here are two enemies that you need to avoid. Number one is rigidity. Rigidity. One of the biggest killers of merciful living, I think, is rigidity. Rigidity is the trademark of legalism. It comes out of the spirit of legalism. So you become a very rigid person. And once legalism takes root, the church becomes cold, it becomes rigid, it becomes unwelcoming. And there is no longer room to make mistakes. People are not free to grow anymore. We are made to feel guilty whenever we do not measure up. We become conscious of what others will say about us. And we can become overly concerned about uh, how other people think of us. We feel bound. Uh, controlled, restricted, and, and tensed up. We're no longer free. So we become religious, but not necessarily spiritual. Okay? Rigidity is a huge enemy to merciful living. I'd like you to listen to what Micah 6, 8, which is such a powerful verse when it comes to uh, justice and mercy. Now, Micah 6, 8 says this, He has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. You can see three things there, right? Three things that is required by God. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And I'd like you to notice that it's actually a progression. Okay, why do I say that? It's because justice will take you this far, but mercy will take you beyond. Okay? Justice will take you this far, but mercy will take you beyond. Now, justice gives you what you deserve, but mercy can take you beyond. Okay, Justice gives you what we deserve, but many of us, how many of us are willing to go beyond and actually show mercy? And it's only when we act justly and we love mercy, then we can walk truly humbly before our God. All three, I think, are interrelated. If you have mercy without justice, it's a bit like indulgence. But if you have justice without mercy, it becomes legalism. 
Does that make sense? If you love mercy without acting justly, it can become indulgence or license. But if you act justly without mercy, it can become legalism. And only a truly humble person can possess both justice and mercy. See, and all three are related. And these three things are required by God. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Listen to this. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tithe of your spice, uh, spices like mint, dill, and cummings, but you neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced a letter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain on the gut, but you swallow a camel. And, and I think this is so... So interesting. You know, we can get so rigid with small things and then we miss the important things. It's so easy in, in our spiritual life to actually end up majoring on the minor. And you find that the major things in the New Testament, they, they tend to be inward rather than outward. Justice and mercy must kiss one another. Here you, again, you'll find it. Justice, mercy, faithfulness coming together. Psalms 85 verse 10 says, mercy and truth has met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Beautiful. James chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Speak and act like those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You know, here the Apostle James reminded all of us who lives in the new covenant, live by the law of love, which gives liberty and extends mercy to one another instead of just judgment. Let mercy triumph over judgment. I like the story that was told about um, a man who came to speak to John Wesley. And this man said to John Wesley, I never forgive. And John Wesley turned to him and replied, I hope you never sin also. I never forgive. I hope you never sin also. You know why? Because in the same way that we judge others, you will be judged. And we all tend to judge others. Some of us judge inside. Others of us let it all out there. And we actually show it. You know, and remember how Jesus talked about a guy who got a piece of timber in his hanging out of his eyes. And then he goes around telling others, excuse me, do you realize you got a toothpick in your eye? You know, he's got a timber in his own and he cannot see in he, he, he can't see. And all he can see is a toothpick in other people's eyes. Judgmental people are like that. They see other people's faults, but they cannot detect their own. No, I, I always think of a judgmental spirit is like having bad breath, you know. Everybody around you know except you, you know. <laughs> that's what judgmental people tend to be. So that's rigidity. That's number one. Biggest enemy against merciful living, number one, rigidity. That comes out of a spirit of legalism. Here's number two, is retaliation. Retaliation. Another big enemy to merciful living is when we have this great need to retaliate, to fight back, you know, and we just have to get even all the time. We have to take revenge. We cannot let go and let God take control. We find it so difficult to apply Romans 12, 17, you know, where the Apostle Paul challenges us, Repay no one evil for evil. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. I think one of the best ways to destroy your enemy is to make him your friend. You know, and unforgiveness is a prolonged form of suicide. You know, forgiveness is to set somebody else free and that someone is you. You know, when we forgive, we set firstly ourselves free. You cannot get ahead when you're constantly trying to get even. 
See, never is God more real to you than when we forgo the right to retaliate and choose to show mercy instead. You know, maybe you will say in your heart, you know, it's not my fault. What? Why should I show mercy? It's not my fault in the first place. But that's precisely the point. You cannot truly show mercy unless you have the right to retaliate. You see my point? If you are wrong in the first place, then it's not about mercy anymore. That's justice. Then you should eat humble pie. But the point is, it's because you are right, precisely because somebody else wronged you. And then that's when you can choose to show mercy. You have a right to re retaliate, but you choose not to. You cannot give mercy unless it is justified for you not to. That's my point. The other party is at fault. They deserve to get it from you. You have every right to whack them, but you choose not to. And at this point, when you have every right to retaliate, at this point, love enters the picture. Not to cancel out truth. Huh? Please understand, I'm not asking you to ignore what is right and wrong. But it's not to cancel out truth, but to control it. Okay? You choose to show mercy even though it's not deserved. But because of God's love, we choose to show mercy. Now, perhaps the best way to try and understand mercy is to see it in the form of a, uh, see it in action. Now, let, let me put some flesh and bones to this concept of mercy. Think about Joseph, right? The biblical character of Joseph and his brothers. It would have been justifiable, I think, for Joseph to hate his brothers and literally to whack them for what they have done to him. They lied about him. They plotted against him. They sold him as a slave to a foreign land. They were all out to kill him, get rid of him. He ended up in a strange land. He was seduced by his boss's wife, falsely accused of immorality, and then cast into prison. But you cannot keep a good man down, so God raised him up, and he has now become the second in command of Egypt, the prime minister. And his brothers came from Israel and are now kneeling before him. They didn't even realize it was him. He could have retaliated. He could have eaten them for dinner and it would have been justified. But instead, I think Joseph chose to go outside when he saw his brothers, all the emotions come up and I think it's very real. All the resentment can come up. All the pain can come up. What did he do? He chose to get out of the room, cry his heart out, you know, cry out all his resentment. And then he came back and chose to show mercy. He didn't yield to the temptation of retaliation, but instead chose to be merciful and forgive. That, my brothers and sisters, is mercy in action. Now, that is the counterculture kingdom value. He was rejected, wrong, hated, falsely accused, misunderstood, and disgraced. And if there ever was a candidate for bitterness, Joseph would be the first. But he chose the high road instead of mercy and grace. And as a result, he saw the glory of God. But you know what was his secret? What enabled him to do that? It's because right from the beginning, he chose not to remember his offense. He chose not to remember his offenses. In fact, in Genesis 41, verse 51, it says this, Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and all my father's household. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God, has made me forget all my troubles and all my father's household. You know, to overlook the wrongs that are done against us and to exercise mercy is a supernatural thing. I don't think by ourselves we can do it. It is, how, how do you forget all the pain and all the trouble and all the wrongs that's ever been done to you? It is only God who can do the erasing. And that's what Joseph said. God has made me forget. On our own, I think we cannot do it. But with God, all things are possible. The prophet Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 54, verse 4 and verse 5. Listen to this. He says, fear not, 
for you will not be put to shame. Neither feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. But you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood, and you will remember no more. For your household is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. Your husband is your maker. See, the Lord promised you that you can forget the offenses because he will personally take the place of your painful memories. For any one of you who are listening in uh, this evening, maybe you have a painful youth or traumatic childhood, even tragic loss of a loved one, or you have been betrayed, you have been hurt, you have been wrong in some way. I want you to know that the living God can replace those awesome memories with himself. Hallelujah. If you would choose to forgive, God is able to enter in and do the erasing for you. These are the two big enemies to merciful living. Number one, rigidity. Number two, retaliation. The Lord assures you that those who are merciful will obtain mercy. And then Psalms 23, 6 will be true in your life. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Let me end with this. And uh, You know, there's a story told about a man who married this beautiful girl and he was an ordinary looking guy, but the wife that he married was a ravishing beauty. And it was very good at the beginning because he felt so proud, you know, when all the men that walked past still glances at his wife and all that. But over time, uh, he began to feel a little bit insecure about her. And over time, he, he, was, he, he, he began to have th this great fear that one day the wife would be unfaithful to him. And that thought began to haunt him, you know. And finally, it came to a point he couldn't take it anymore. And one night he came home and he splashed acid, you know, on her face. And from a ravishing beauty, she became an ugly, scarred woman. The children were so angry with what the father did that they took their mom and left their father. And as a result, the couple was separated for years. And then one day, many years later, a letter arrived, you know. And the man, by that time, has contracted cancer and only had a few more months to live. And he could no longer take care of himself. So he wrote to his wife and asked if he could come and live with them. The children were adamant that he should not come. They want to have nothing to do with him. But you know, this kind-hearted woman begged the children to take him home. And they did. He took him home, forgave him of all he has done in the past, for all the injustice that he has done towards her, cared for him until he passed away. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is what mercy is all about. It is when we withhold what is deserved and then we release what is not deserved. But you think about it, isn't this exactly what our Lord Jesus has done for all of us? On that cross 2,000 years ago, the Son of God demonstrated what mercy is by hanging on that cruel cross so that we can all today be forgiven. The only difference is that he was not shown mercy at all when he was on that cross, but he chose to show mercy to all of us by declaring, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And today, you and I have become undeserving recipients of God's mercy and grace. And the only logical response that you and I can make would be to in turn show mercy to those who have wronged us. And when we do so, the cycle of mercy, the flow of mercy can continue to flow. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. This is beatitude number five. And it's such an important one. And my prayer is that all of us will become men and women of mercy. And we run away, we turn away from rigidity and we choose never to retaliate. But instead, we go beyond justice into mercy. And then together we can truly 
do justly, love mercy, and then we can walk humbly before our God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. And I'll pass this time back to Winnie. Thank you, Pastor Benny. Um, it's, a very, very, it's a good session on the Beatitude number five. Bless, when Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for mm. they will be shown mercy. So right now, we will proceed uh, right away into our first Q&A segment. Uh, once again, we apologize that we may not be able to answer all the questions. We'll try our yep. best. Uh, plus, please uh, post your questions on the Q&A box and then you can upvote. Click the like and then you can upvote the question. First question, mm. Pastor Benny, how do okay. we cultivate a heart of mercy? <laughs> a practical session. Every time we will have this quite practical question. <laughs> how do you cultivate a heart of mercy? I think, yeah. first of all, we... Um, we need to really reflect on how much we have been shown mercy. Um, it's exactly like um, what the Apostle John say in First John, that we love only because he first loved us. And I don't think we can truly understand um, or, or truly be able to love until we first reflected on how much we are first loved. Now, the same concept apply for mercy. Uh, it's only when we truly understand that we have been shown so much mercy by God, that is where we find uh, the grace to be able to be merciful to others uh, also. Uh, the other is, is to really walk a mile in other people's shoes. Okay, so first is from within ourselves that we need to realize how much we have been shown mercy and therefore we should reciprocate by showing mercy to others. That's number one. Number two is to see it from the other person's point of view. If you understand how much people have gone through, if we understand their situation, we will find it easier to show mercy. Um, I think it was John Wesley who once said this. He said that to understand all is to forgive all. You know, by that, what he meant was sometimes we find people so obnoxious. We find people so, you know, why are they behaving like that? And then we, we get really upset and we, we feel like they really deserve, you know, every bad thing that will happen to them. But when you truly understand what people go through, if you truly understand their background and you truly understand their situation, perhaps we will be able to put ourselves in their shoe. And as a result, find a grace to be able to show mercy, to be a bit more understanding. So I think it's both, both of that. First, ourself. Um, we ourselves have been deeply forgiven. Uh, we have shown, God has shown us a lot of mercy. Other people have shown us mercy. Therefore, we should reciprocate. Number two, if we understand the other party's situation, put yourself in their shoes because that's what mercy is, getting under the skin of another person. Then we understand what they go through. You may find that you'll be more inclined to actually act on their behalf and show mercy. So that will be the two things I will leave with you. Okay, so thank you for helping us to understand how to cultivate a heart of mercy. So now coming to even a bit harder question is, yeah. how far should we extend mercy to someone who is unrepentant? <laughs> yeah, this is a hard one because yes, there are very uh, recalcitrant people who refuse to um, actually change or refuse to repent. And how much do we show mercy? I'll put it this way. Um, I think we, in, in this case, right, uh, we are firstly dealing with forgiveness uh, because they are people who probably has hurt us, people who have done things to us and we feel it and we feel like they should change. They should repent before we, we, we let them go. Um, my take is that we always forgive them for the pain that they cause to us. We, can, we, we must always choose to forgive. We must always choose to be merciful and forgive. Okay? But we can only forgive them for the pain that they cause to us. That we can choose to let go. But it is not our job to forgive them of their sin. Uh, but because only God can forgive sin. We can forgive people for the pain they cause us, for the hurt they cause us. But in order for their sin to be forgiven, they need 
to sort it out with God. They need to repent before God. I hope that makes sense. So we forgive them for what they do to us, but they still need to sort out their sin with God because only God, it is God's department to forgive sin. It's our department to forgive them of what they did to us and the pain that they, they did to us. So when it comes, therefore, it is always, the onus is always on us to be merciful and to choose to let people go for the pain they cause us. But leave the forgiveness of sin to God. And whether that person is going to repent and, and actually deal with their sin, that is between the person and God. But as far as we are concerned, we are merciful in choosing to let them go for the pain that they cause us, which is, I think, uh, what most of us would struggle with. True. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Benny. Um, another difficult question. Okay. Should the death sentence be abolished then since it seems oh. to be paid evil for evil? <laughs> <laughs> Have mercy on <Okay>. me. <laughs> Uh, this one is God's department, <laughs> and um, I I think there is um there is that that element of justice um um that is that is God's department really, and I I I don't really have a I, I'm not uh I'm not ready to give you an answer for that one because it it, it has its own controversy, but um perhaps I can. Uh, come back to you on that that one. Uh, let me think about this and see if I could put that put together a a, a good good uh, answer to that one before I come back and answer it. Would that would you would you kind of raise it up uh, for me the next round, the okay. last week? Yeah. yeah, and I'll get you all the verses and all that before I before I answer that. Okay. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, with that, actually, I think it's also about time. We can move on to session number. We are to number six, right? Okay, number six. Sure. On All blessed right. are the pure in heart, but they will see God. Okay, thank okay. you from Matthew 5 8. Over to you. All right, thank you. So I hope you are ready. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, there was once an emperor who was reaching old age, and so he wanted to appoint his next successor, to appoint his successor, but he had no children of his own. So he decided that he would summon uh, some of the young people, some of the young men in his country and bring them together. And then he gave each one of them a packet of seeds, okay, a packet of seeds, and he told them that they must plant these seeds. And then in one year's time, they must bring the plant back to him okay and the emperor will then pick the best plan and the best plan will be made the next the best plan the owner of the best plan will be made the next emperor so everything is going to depend on this plan that they can plant out of this pack of seeds so one of the the young man was had a, had a name of john so john went home and he planted his the seeds he watered it he fertilized it and then he waited for it to grow the funny thing is that months passed, but nothing grew. Now, the other young men um, were not talking about, the, the, all the other young men seems to be talking about how well their plant is growing, but uh, it seems like John's one is just, just not happening. And, and one whole year went by, and he, John could actually see and keep hearing of all the good reports of all the plants that the other young men are having. And he was really growing rather anxious. And finally, the day came when it, all of them need to present their plans to the emperor. So they all took up to the emperor and there was so many beautiful plans all over. And the emperor was very excited and he told them that this is the day that he's going to appoint his successor. So he went around examining all the plants that were blossoming. And then he finally came to John's plant and all he had was an empty pot. And the moment the the emperor saw that pot. He says, here, he declared to everybody, here is your new emperor. The people were all shocked and they didn't understand why the emperor actually chose John. And then the emperor explained. He says, one year ago, I gave every one of you a packet of cooked seeds. In other words, those seeds are all dead. They cannot grow. So obviously, all of you must have substituted my seeds for your own. 
with your own, right? Only John is honest enough to bring me the pot with the cooked seeds still inside. And this is the man of integrity that I am looking for to rule my kingdom. And here's my point. Integrity made a way for this young man to ascend the throne. Jesus in Matthew 5, 8 put it this way. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this, fin this final session for tonight. We're going to be talking about purity of heart. Now, firstly, I'd like you to notice that this is a quality that emphasizes the inner man. It deals with our inner thoughts, our motives, our intentions. And it is not just doing the right things. It is doing the right things for the right reasons. Purity of heart. Now, the word pure in the Bible has two basic meanings. Okay, The first is this. It means clean. Okay. And the second, it means it's unmixed. I think this, uh, it, it, it is clean, number one. Number two, it is unmixed or untainted, if you like. So the word pure that is used in the Beatitudes is in the context of both being clean, okay, pure, as well as untainted, unmixed. It's like milk that has that is pure and without water, so it's undiluted. Uh, it is like pure jam with no preservatives. It is like gold that is purified and is untainted with other minerals okay, and, and other metals. It is being uncontaminated without corruption, if you like, without gall, sometimes the Bible call it, but sincere, honest in motive. Okay, the idea here is basically that of integrity. Blessed are the integral. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those that are clean, unmixed, untainted, uncontaminated. A heart that is pure is one that is single-minded. Okay, it's single-minded. It, it is unmixed. Okay, it is a heart without division, single-heartedness. It is without hypocrisy. It is without falsehood. So then, where, then once that is the case, once your heart is pure, then what you see is what you get. Okay? It is authentic. It is not an act. It's like Coca-Cola would say, it's the real thing. You see, when God saves us to the cross, He did not just clean us up, but He also gave us a heart that is single towards Him. Psalms 86 verse 11. Let me read this. What the Sami said, teach me your way, O God, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Okay, King David is asking here for what? A pure heart, a heart that is undivided, okay, a heart that is single, okay, fully devoted. That's what he's asking for, a pure heart. Jesus talked about this singleness of heart also. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. Listen to this one. He said, The eye is the lamb of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and uh, seek to please the other. Okay, you cannot serve both God and money. What is Jesus asking for? He is actually pointing to the fact that once the heart is pure, there will be a singleness of devotion and desire towards God. And this wholeheartedness, if you like, um, and once there is wholeheartedness, then there is no place for spiritual adultery in our heart. You end up serving only God. And you come to this place like the beloved, you know, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 4, that says, I found the one that my heart loves. I held him and would not let him go. See, when our hearts is pure, it is when, when it is single towards God, 
when it has integrity, full sincerity, we have found the one our heart loves. We hold on to him and we won't let it go. You know what? We have all found the one whom our heart loves. And what we need to do now is to hold on to him tenaciously, refuse to let go. That is wholeheartedness. Half-heartedness towards God is a terrible way to live. It is a heart that is divided. You know, you end up like the man who wear two watches. You are never sure of the time. You know, one watch tell you it's 12.05, the other one tell you 12.06. Which one do you believe? You know, when the heart is divided, we can no longer be, be clear, you see. And if the heart is, on one hand, uh, we tend to speak of the importance of spiritual things, but our lives are geared towards that which feeds the soul. Why? Because the heart is divided. See, and many believers actually live half-hearted lives. And after a while, we kind of accept it as normal. And it's not that we are lacking in beliefs, you know, but we are lacking in clear vision. A vision of what the Christian life can be when it is lifted out of a heart that is fully and singularly devoted to God. A half-hearted Christian cannot please God. To me, I think when it comes to the Christian life, it is all the way or no way. It's like pre being pregnant, you know, you're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. You can be, cannot be a little bit pregnant, you know. So it's the same, you know, when it comes to devotion to God, why don't we be wholehearted? Let it be pure in heart, undivided, integrated. See, we need to learn to say with King David in Psalms 50, 57, where he actually said, my heart is fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. No more duplicity or double-mindedness. That is integrity. And I think this is the secret to David's success as a king. You know, in Psalm 78, it tells us why David was chosen to be the king of Israel. In Psalm 78, verse 70 and to 72, listen to this. God chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob of Israel, and his inheritance. And then David shepherded God's people with integrity of heart and with skillful hands, he led them. I like this. Why did God choose David and took him from tending sheep to looking after the people of God? It's because David had two things. Number one, integrity of heart. And number two, skillful hands. See, but it starts with what? Integrity of heart. Because he had pure heart and then he had skillful hands. David shepherded God's people or led God's people. Um, he did both. He shepherded them with integrity of heart and then he led them with skillful hands. He's both pastoral as well as leader. You see, and David had both heart as well as hands, both integrity as well as skills. See, sometimes no matter how. Um, sincere our hearts may be if we have no skill it's also not enough but no matter how skillful you are if your heart is not in the right place if your heart is not pure it will also not work and this is the strength of david's leadership he had both integrity of heart and skillful hands let me put it in another way um, we need both integrity of person as well as integrity of principles. We don't just need a right posture of heart. You also need right principles. Okay, and we need both. Sometimes we can be sincere and pure in our purpose, in our intention, in our motivation. But if we violate sound principles, do the wrong thing, we will also bear the consequences. Now, the reverse is also true. Sometimes we can have all the right principles, but if the posture of our heart is wrong, the whole thing can turn out wrong also. See? So integrity is important. Skill is also important. But if I put the two side by side, I think integrity of heart must come before skillful hands. And integrity is a passion in King David's life and ministry. Look at Psalm 7, verse 8. Uh, he said, judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is in me. 
See, that's the psalmist talking. Look at Psalms 25 verse 21. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for thee. Look at Psalms 26 verse 1. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity. So to be pure of heart is really all about having integrity, integral, okay, coherent. So, so that my beliefs and my behavior all come together I have, out of a pure heart. Now, if I say that I'm a person of integrity, what, what does it mean? It means that my words and my deeds match up. I practice what I preach. I say what I mean. I mean what I say. I live out what I proclaim. And I am what I appear to be. My public persona, you know, and what I do on the outside, in the, in the public uh, sphere, and my private self, it is coherent. So how I am in front of you as, a, as people I don't really know, but this is my public persona. I think my family must also be able to testify to it that what you see is what you get. That's integrity. Now, the world describes such a person, a person of integrity as a sincere man, right? That's how the world would, uh, the words that the world will use for a man of pure heart, they will call him a sincere man. You know, that word sincere is a very interesting word, sincere. Now, that's why we always sign off our letters by saying, yours sincerely, right? Now, in the ancient world, you know, you know where this word sincere comes from? Because in the ancient world, there's a, Whenever there's a very uh, valuable porcelain, for example, a porcelain vase or a porcelain sculpture that is highly expensive, but sometimes there can be tiny cracks, you know, that, that is on the, the vase or on the, on the sculpture that comes when it is fired, you know, in the furnace. And the problem is that some dishonest merchant, and once you have those, those little cracks, it is no longer that valuable. But the problem is that some dishonest merchants would actually cover up those cracks by using white wax. So they use white wax and they cover it all up. So when people, uh, when collectors go to the market to look for pieces of vase and sculpture, they want to look for those that are pure, without cracks. So what they will do is they'll go to the market and they look for the stores that actually have a sign there that says, Sincera. S-I-N-E-C-E-R-A, -E -E Sincera, from which means uh, without wax. Okay, Sincera means without wax. So there's no wax here. What you see is what you get, nothing hidden. So when you get this, uh, and, and that's, where you, the, 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 that's where we get the word sincere or sincerely. The same word in the Greek actually also means sun-tested sun tested uh, because the only way that you can see all these hidden cracks is by holding the vase uh, under the sunlight so it's under heavy sunlight you can begin to see those little cracks that are hidden if they have, if there's any so what are we saying we're saying that those who are pure in heart those who have in integrity of heart they are those who are sincere those who are without wax there is no shame, there is no hypocrisy, no mask, no bull, if you like. There are no hidden cracks or private skeletons. Even when the searchlight of God's sun or God's word were to shine into their hearts, it will be found pure. That's what integrity really is. And blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. See, the problem is that we tend to live for image rather than integrity. That's what's wrong with the modern world today. We tend to focus more on image than integrity. What's the difference between the two? I think I'll put it this way. Image is who people think we are or we want people to think we are. But integrity is who we really are. And our tendency is to, is to strive too hard you know, to project an image, but we neglect integrity. And this is precisely why Jesus was so harsh, you know, with the Pharisees, because they are huge on external appearance, but so small, so minute on the inside. And they are more concerned about man's approval than God's pleasure. 
And once we live like that, we are no longer real with each other, no longer authentic, but we live under an illusion. We all begin to put on a mask. The same spirit can infiltrate the church of Jesus Christ. And we end up with believers who are afraid to show who we really are, afraid to fail, terrified at exposing our true self. We are afraid now to be authentic. You know why we do that? It's because we are so worried about saving face, isn't it? You know, they, they, I like this saying, you know, in the race to save some face, why not conquer inner space? In the race to save some face, why not conquer inner space? You know, why not live a life of authenticity where we can be real with one another? You know, is that, uh, it, why not behave, you know, with authenticity wherever we are and be, be real and authentic, have integrity of heart? Imagine if our cell groups, you know, in our relationship amongst our small group, in our cell group, we can be authentic. It will be, it will really build true fellowship. You know, when we are willing to uncover ourselves and to show if our heart is not in the right place, we are prepared to share and allow people to help us in the journey. That's why Charles Swindoll, I think, used to say this, there's more fellowship in a bar than a cell group. <laughs> more fellowship in a bar than a cell group. You know why? Because in a bar, people tell the truth. You know, after a few drinks, you know, they will start talking, you know, I just had a fight with my wife. Oh, yeah, me too. You know, that's, tell me about it. And then they have some real fellowship about what is really going on. And Jesus actually say we are in this world, but we are not of this world. You know, we are not a church full of elites, but we are a body of sinners saved by grace. And may we never forget that. But instead, uh, we develop a pure heart, a heart of integrity, a heart of authenticity. Now, you may ask, you know, how then do we become authentic with one another? How do we do that? Now, let me put it this way. Authenticity or integrity is really a product of intimacy. It's a product of intimacy. I don't think authenticity or, in, or integrity or is something that comes out of our willpower or our own or the group dynamics, but it's really born out of intimacy, first with God and then with one another. You see, if I'm intimate with God, if I'm secure in God, I dare to uncover myself with you. But and the other way is, if I'm intimate with you, if I'm close to you, if our relationships are solid, we dare to uncover with each other. You know, and let me uh, bring you biblically to how I come to this conclusion that the integrity or authenticity is really the product of intimacy. I found this in the life of Moses, for example, in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 12 to verse 18. Listen to this. It's such a powerful passage. He says, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who had to put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains in the old covenant is read. In other words, it's talking about the law. If we are still depending on us, the righteousness that comes from keeping the law, on, on being good, then this veil is still there. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read or the law is read, a veil covers their heart. But whenever anyone returns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And, with, and we with unveiled faces now all reflect the Lord's glory and being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You see, my point is this, the pure in heart, if we are in relationship with God, if we have found our security in Christ, you know, not dependent on our ability to, to be good, to keep the law, but rather to be totally abandoned to the fact that God, Christ has saved me by His grace through faith. If we are truly in that kind of intimate, secure relationship with God, then we end up living a life with nothing to prove, nothing to lose, and nothing to hide. And therefore, we become totally secure, free to be what we, what, what we are. Our faces are now 
unveiled. And it is only when we move into the new covenant relationship of grace and intimacy with Christ that we'll be able to come into the liberty of the Spirit. And we move out of the old covenant of the law, which judges us. And we, in turn, take the same law and judge other people. See, the Apostle Paul also put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. Listen to what he said. For I am the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. You see, he's so open, so transparent because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am who I am. You see that purity of heart? You see that uh, authenticity? That, that um, grace-driven life? You know, By the grace of God, I am who I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. You know what Paul is saying? He said, yes, I'm the greatest of sinner. I'm a terrible failure. I don't deserve anything. But because of my relationship with Jesus Christ and because of the grace that he has extended to me, I am who I am. My heart now belongs to him. I'm wholly devoted to him and I'm not afraid. This heart has found its integrity and I can afford to be real with you. Isn't that right? Isn't that what he's saying? By the grace of God, I am who I am. And now let me show you one more passage that to me is so important. And this is from our Lord Jesus himself. Learn from our Lord Jesus in John chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. Listen to this. Now, while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs that he was doing and they believed in his name. But listen, Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about himself, for he knew what was in a man. See, he did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. So what's happening here is this. The people saw what Jesus was doing, that he was powerful. He performed signs, wonders, and miracles. So they all flocked to him but Jesus, they all kind of uphold him. They all begin to, you know, uh, uh, speak well of him. But Jesus knew that man cannot be trusted. He knows the heart of man. He knows all men. He knows they cannot be trusted. They may come to him today, but they may reject him and turn against him tomorrow. And Jesus knows that. You see, and that's why Jesus would not entrust himself to them. Even though Jesus knows that man cannot be trusted and he would not entrust himself to them. But have you noticed something very interesting? In his relationship with people, you know, if we it were, it were asked and we know that someone cannot be trusted, so what do we do? We won't entrust ourselves to them. So what will we, we do? We set up a lot of barriers. We protect. You know, we become very defensive. We are looking out always. We dare not open up because we don't trust the person. But have you ever noticed that in Jesus' relationship with people, he was absolutely open. He was never closed up. He never put up a false front to protect himself. He, does, he did not walk in hypocrisy. He didn't try to project uh, an image of, one, of being one up. You know, he, he communicated deeply with his disciples. He cried publicly at Lazarus' uh, tomb. He wept over Jerusalem. He was very open. With his emotions, with his, with uh, with with all his thing, you know, his his thinking, you know, he would rebuke, he would confront when he needed to. He was very, very authentic, very real. Even the little children would dare to approach him because he's so open, so approachable. Why is that so? It seems like a contradiction here, where he says that he he knows the hearts of men, he know they cannot be trusted, but yet at the same time, in his relationship with men, he is so open. Why is that so? So here's the secret. Listen to me. Jesus knows that man cannot be trusted. Yet, at the same time, he did not trust man, but he trusted his Father in heaven. He knows that man can have bad intention, but he also knows at the same time, because he trusts God, because he's intimate with God, he knows that God will not allow anything to happen to him that God did not allow. So here's my point. 
His security is not in man, but his security is in God. And because he's secure in his relationship with God, therefore, he can be transparent and open with men because he knows men cannot do anything to him that the Father is not aware of. And because he's intimate with God, he can become real with men. That's the key. How do you become real, authentic, open, transparent person? It is by first finding your security and intimacy in God. And once you are intimate with God, then you need not hide anything. You can become open. Authenticity is a product of intimacy. And when you spend time with God, you become real with men. In solitude, we find our security. God becomes our anchor and our compass and we build depth and we develop substance as a result. We allow God to be the one to access our life and we allow God to love us for who we are. And then his rebukes and his affirmation is what becomes critical to all of us. It's what matters to us. It's no longer what man says. It's no longer what man thinks about us but it's what God says about us that really matters. So brothers and sisters, I want to end by saying this. How do you develop a heart of integrity, of authenticity, where we have nothing to prove, nothing to lose, and nothing to hide? It is firstly by being intimate with God, and then we can be real with men. Integrity with men is a product of intimacy with God. And because it is in those quiet moments alone with God that God whispers His love, His assurance, His promises to us that gives us a deep sense of security and a deep sense of freedom and liberty, just like Moses, just like Paul, you know, just like our Lord Jesus. And God then frees us from our fears and He sets us free and set us loose from the prison of self centeredness and out of that deep security in God we relate authentically and integrity with integrity towards men. I'm not afraid to be real because we take our bearings from God and not men. And brothers and sisters I want you to know that the highest joy of man really comes from cultivating the deepest part of man which is the heart. And when the heart is pure then the vision becomes clear and a man will see God. You know, our eyes always see what our heart loves. You know, just like if where our treasures is, there our heart will be also. You know, our eyes always see what our heart loves. If your heart loves God and is single in his devotion towards God, then your eyes will see God even when others do not. You know, Psalms 41, verse 12. Let me end with this verse. As for me, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face forever. David had a pure heart and that's why he saw the face of God. You uphold me in my integrity, a pure heart, and you set me before your face forever. You see, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. Amen. I hope that that has blessed your heart. And uh, we will go back to Winnie now and uh, take any of your questions before we pray. Yes. Winnie, uh, over to you. Thank you, Pastor Benny. Uh, all right. So, part the Zoom, Zoom participants, you can feel free to uh, post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, Pastor yeah. Benny, one question. Yep. Mm. Uh, what does they shall see God mean? How do we see God in our context? Mm. I think we, what that means really means that we will begin to see the, the acts of God, the hand of God. We begin to see God's character. We begin to see God's hand and God's uh, involvement you know, in the things that we do. We begin to see who God really is. And I think it also means that we can begin to know God. You know, to see God means also to know God. 
uh, which means if our heart is pure, even the word of God becomes alive to us. Even the uh, we begin to know him, the word unveils itself. We begin to see the character of God. We begin to see who God is. We begin to see God's hand uh, in the circumstances, situations around us because our heart is pure. Uh, because our heart is intimate with him, we begin to see him in everything. Uh, I, I believe that's what it means to say that we can see God. It's more than just a physical sighting, but it's about the, re the relationship that allow us to know who God is. Okay. Uh, so the next question also hmm. is about, are we able to achieve a truly pure heart while on <laughs> earth? How do we wrestle with the distractions or even idols that plague us? Yeah, I, I agree that, um, I will put it this way. I think all of us will be very quick to admit that we are not in the stage of perfection. And therefore, our hearts are not always untainted. It's not so undiluted. Uh, but at the same time, I want to be, also encourage all of us to know that is it possible to be perfect? Um, I think the possibility is always there. If not, then God has actually asked us to do something that is impossible. He actually challenges us in First Peter, for example, be perfect as I am perfect. Um, how He would not challenge us if it is not possible. So the while the while the possibility the, the possibility of victory is always there, but that victory is not an ongoing victory. It is a moment-by-moment moment victory, which means to say that it is a daily, it's just like Paul says, you know, I die daily. It's a daily walk with God rather than I reach there and then I stay there. I don't think it's like that. So our heart, uh, is constantly can be bombarded with all kinds of distraction, with all kinds of things that can draw our hearts away. But is it possible to overcome them? I think it is possible uh, if we live moment by moment by the Spirit. So that's what we're talking about. But having said that, uh, many of us, or all of us will be the first to admit that we don't always walk in that victory. And so therefore, it's a constant day by day working out of our faith. And that's what we are doing. But at least once we are aware of what it means to have an integral heart, then we, we want to allow the Holy Spirit to take us there. And it's a day by day exercise. Yeah. Okay. Let me take a look at this next question. Okay. Okay. Marketplace. It is always a great challenge to remain pure in heart, especially yes. in the marketplace. What mm. should our heart posture be and how can, what can we do? Yeah. Yeah. I think in the, in the marketplace, again, there's lots of challenges and lots of things that, you know, uh, there's sometimes some of those things are even beyond our control because we had to, we work within an organization that don't always uphold the right values. So I can understand where the questioner is coming from. And I fully understand that and want, and want the person to know that um, we, we are not, we, we, we do recognize the real struggle that is there. But at the same time, you know, we, that's why the marketplace is really a better feel in that sense for the believer. And we go there, uh, we must always go with the right perspective that I am there uh, not just to make a, a paycheck, but I am there to really be a representative of the Lord. And therefore, um, we want to be totally dependent upon God. And that's why I think you don't want to go to work every morning without first doing what we call the PDA, you know, use the PDA as a good example, as a good framework for you to go to work with. The P stands for personal revival. Um, you would want to go to your workplace, personally revive first. And that's why I want to encourage everyone who works in the marketplace, before you go to work, 
why don't you take some time to really spend with God, even if it is a short time, and I know how, how uh, time tight we can be, but we need to spend some time in prayer, spend some time in the Word, so that we experience a personal revival. So that's P. The D stands for divine appointments. I believe that if you are personally revived, if you have spent time with God and you start the day in the presence of God, remember, integrity comes out of intimacy. So out of the intimate walk with God, you go to work you know, with the armor of God fully on, you go to work personally revived, and then you look out for divine appointments. And there will be opportunities for you to literally uh, have divine moments where someone in need, you could speak a word of encouragement to someone who, or even a challenging moment comes up, you know it is a divine appointment for you to stand up for what is right. Then because you are already looking out for it, you'll be conscious of it. And then the A stands, um, the, the, the A stands for uh, active, active obedience. obedience, right? Active obedience. You actively obey what God wants you to do. Um, and therefore, in so doing, we begin to live out our uh, live out the, the Christian faith that we have. And I want to encourage every one of us to do that. And how can we not want to practice this, especially when we all know that the marketplace is almost like a better field? So you don't want to go into the better field without first being personally revived, you know, looking out for those divine appointments and actively choosing to do what is right. And may the Lord give us that grace, you know, and that heart to actually do that. Yeah, so my, here's, that's my response uh, to your question. And I know how difficult it can be, so full understanding. <laughs> yes, yes uh, I love this acronym, PDA. I have learned this a few years ago and also apply it. Yeah. And I believe that it's, uh, it's practical. I think it does yeah. uh, help us to live mm. out be a witness for the Lord also in the marketplace. Yes. Even as we mm. handle bosses and colleagues. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, uh, Pastor Benny, for tonight. A very good and reaching session to be learning from both the Beatitude, these two Beatitude, and we will learn from you the next two in our final session. And that is okay. coming up on the 24th, 24th of September, also a Thursday, 8 to 9.30. So for those of you on Zoom, you have already signed up. Uh, we will be sending you the Zoom link again to join us uh, two, two Thursdays from now. Okay. Yeah. And we have a few more webinars coming up. Uh, maybe we can have the slides on. Okay. So two more webinars. On this Saturday, on the 12th of September, under our Collab to Reach series number four, Equipping for Evangelism by Max Jagannathan from RZI in Asia. It will be happening 9 to 12 p.m. Feel free to take a QR code and scan it and sign up and register for this Saturday's webinar. And the next uh, Collab to Reach number five, is coming out also this month on the 26th of September, Saturday, 9 to 12. It is helping youth discover their purpose and their life direction by the Significance Project team of Crew Singapore. So please uh, feel free to sign up and join us. We love to have you come and learn and be equipped how you can be helping your youth in your youth ministries. And, and the next Tuesday talk, number nine, Tuesday talk number nine is on the 29th September. Building Community Resilience to Literacy, the Ministry of Reading by Readables and Reading Roots. So do find out more information. When you scan the QR code, you will find out more info. If not, you will be receiving also an email from us. You have, you have registered for tonight's session. You will be receiving a follow-up email. Please feel free to give us your feedback uh, through the feedback form so that we can know um, how was this session for you. And finally, these two sessions, uh, these few sessions have been brought to you uh, by Crew Singapore, and we would love to uh, request that if you would love to give for any, uh, give us a love gift, you can also scan a QR code on the left to give to Crew Singapore. On the right is to arrow resources that Pastor Benny is in. So with that, uh, we've come to the end of tonight's 
um, lesson and we would love to be praying for Pastor Benny and also all of us as we close tonight. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you so much for helping us to learn, mm. learn from the word of God, learn to apply the word of God. We pray, Father, for a transformation of our hearts, of our minds, and we pray, Father, even when we experience you and encounter you through personal revival. Father, we pray that you will refresh our heart and grant us divine appointments along the way, along the day, with our neighbours, with our colleagues, with the people that will be meeting on the streets. We pray, Father, we'll respond with active obedience uh, to be loving you, to be showing your love, to be genuine to people. Grant us a heart of purity. Grant us, show us your mercy and as we also learn to show mercy to others. So thank you so much for Pastor Benny for teaching us. Thank we you. pray for him that he will also um, enjoy uh, this whole ministry of teaching as you have gifted him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Benny. Thank you. See you again Sorry. in two weeks. <laughs> okay. Sorry we ran out of time. I couldn't answer all the questions. I would love to answer one or two more, but maybe the next webinar, it can be raised again. Huh? Okay. We will try to remember question. Thank that you. question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank Good you, night. everyone. Good night. Good night. See you again.